Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. My name is Eric Solomon. I'm director of Arctic programs here at the Vancouver Aquarium. Uh, and the Vancouver Aquarium Marine Science Center's Arctic program works to enhance scientific understanding of the Arctic and the role of local and traditional knowledge in that understanding, to inform and engage the public about the Arctic and Arctic issues, and uh, to work with northern communities to set and realize their own local research priorities. Um, tonight is about informing and engaging and sharing the perspectives of three uh, very distinguished researchers, Dr. Kevin Arrigo, Michelle Kopis, and Candace Callison. Before we get started, I want to invite up uh, Dr. Philippe Tortel, who's the director of uh, the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, and he's going to say just a couple words. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of you for coming out. Uh, indeed, my name is Philippe Tortel. I'm an oceanographer at the University of British Columbia, and I'm also the director of the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. The institute was founded about 25 years ago to foster interdisciplinary exchange on big picture questions that matter deeply to society. And I think because you're all here now, you will agree with me that the questions of Arctic change, particularly in Arctic Canada, climate change rather, particularly in Arctic Canada, are a really excellent example where we need deep thinking from many, many dif different disciplinary perspectives to advance understanding. Our partnership with the Vancouver Aquarium goes back seven or eight years now to a time when we were just starting as a community to put together a major research initiative, the Arctic Geotraces Program. And that program resulted in a $5 million grant from, from the federal government to do really important research in the Arctic. And tonight, we have a gathering of scientists as part of the Arctic Geotraces program as we wrap up that, that program and look towards the future. So I'm really pleased to be able to be here and to welcome three, as a three a distinguished researchers who are going to give you their own perspectives and their interdisciplinary perspectives on what the massive changes unfolding in the Arctic are likely to mean for the livelihoods of northern communities. Thanks, Philippe. So, you know, looking around the room, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that I don't need to give a long introduction about all the changes that are going on in the Arctic and, and why. Uh, we have uh, some of the, the the most distinguished oceanographers and Arctic scientists uh, that are that are working today in the room, and uh, and but I do want to point out, you know, just a, a reminder that you know we are seeing record monthly low sea ice extents. We continue to lose September sea ice at at 13 percent per decade. Um, Arctic air temperatures are are increasing at twice the rate of the rest of the planet, and we're likely. Or, or looking at the possibility of, of seeing uh, ice-free Septembers in, in the 2030s. So the Arctic of today really is different than the Arctic of just 20 years ago. It really has changed in, in many ways, and it continues to evolve in many ways. Um, all three of our speakers tonight are addressing that change in various ways. One is focused on sea ice and the ecosystem that it so strongly influences. One is focused on changes in land-based ice and impacts on coastal ecosystems in the communities. Uh, and one on how we communicate about these changes in the media and the many implications of that. Uh, I want to just do a, a quick bit of housekeeping before I introduce our guests. First of all, uh, I'm going to guess that just about everybody in here has some kind of electric, electronic device on them. Uh, I think you know what to do at this point. How's the time? Uh, also, if you need to use the washrooms or you need to, to leave for any particular reason, you're just so overwhelmed by the amazingness of our speakers tonight, you just got to get some fresh air, whatever it is. Um, you want to head out the back doors here. It uh, causes a little bit less of a disturbance, and if you're looking for the washrooms, you'll find them just right outside the doorway uh, in, in, uh, in the area right out in front there. Uh, and then finally, we will have questions and answers at the end. So if, you, uh, if you're able to hold your questions until the end, that would be great. If you have a question that you're just looking for some clarification and, you, and, and you'd like to get that clarification while the speaker is still up, by all means raise your hand. Uh, but we'll try and keep most of the questions to the end and we'll have a fair bit of time for that. So um, with that, let me introduce our three speakers and then we'll have them go one, one after the other. Uh, 
Dr. Kevin R. Arrigo is a professor in the Department of Earth System Science at Stanford University and the director of the uh, Interdisciplinary Earth Systems Program. He's a biological oceanographer whose work examines the role of microalgae in the biological productivity in polar oceans. His interdisciplinary approach to research includes satellite remote sensing, computer modeling, and field studies on oceanographic research vessels. He completed a postdoctoral degree while working at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Our second speaker, Dr. Michelle Kopis, is an assistant professor in geography at UBC and Canada Research Chair in Landscapes of Climate Change. Her work in forensic geomorphology is aimed at reading landscapes to decipher the forces that shape them, with a particular focus on glaciers and their impact in shaping polar regions at a variety of timescales from years to millennia. Dr. Kopis has current field projects in high places all over the world, from BC to Patagonia, Alaska, the Himalayas, Greenland, and Antarctica, where her team combines detailed field observations with numerical modeling of ice ocean dynamics and glacier mass balance. And our third speaker tonight is Dr. Candace Callison. Dr. Callison is an associate professor in the Graduate School of Journalism at UBC. Her research and teaching are focused on changes to media practices and platforms, journalism ethics, the role of social movements in public discourse and understanding how issues related to science and technology become meaningful for diverse publics. Dr. Callison leads a research team on Arctic journalism, researching changes to professional norms, practices, and standards for Canadian Arctic journalists working in an era of environmental change and global audiences. So with that, I'll uh, ask Dr. Arrigo to come on up. Well, thank you all for coming. So I'm going to be talking about the Arctic Ocean, and specifically I'm going to be talking about a couple things related to loss of sea ice. Now, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody in this room that the Arctic Ocean is an area dominated by ice. In fact, it is what makes the Arctic the Arctic. Without the Arctic, it's a completely different system, completely different animals living there, completely different lifestyles. And because it's got ice, it's got a unique characteristic that things have evolved to live in. The ice extent varies on a seasonal time scale. We've got minimum ice in September, maximum ice sometime in March. But this has been changing in recent years, as Eric alluded to. This is a, this is a plot of changes in sea ice in the winter time between 1870 and not quite the present, but pretty close to the present. You can see for most of the time series, up till about 1950, the sea ice in the Arctic was pretty constant. And then starting in 1950, we've had this precipitous decline that's only accelerating as time goes on. This is the extent of the ice. And if we look specific here, this again now is sea ice extent between February and June. And what it shows is the gray areas at the top are basically kind of average sea ice years, what you would see. 2012 saw the lowest sea ice ever in September. Uh, and it, we don't go all the way to September, but you can see it's the record low. 2017, the year we're in now, is setting the record. It's already set the record for the lowest amount of ice in the winter, and it's already the lowest sea ice in the, in the spring. We don't know yet what's going to happen in the summer, but it's, again, it's a very low ice year. Now, sea ice extent is very important. Uh, we've lost 50% of the ice cover in the summertime already, but the extent of the sea ice isn't the only thing. Even more dramatic has been the loss of sea ice volume. And by sea ice volume, I mean how extensive it is and how thick it is. And what's happened in the Arctic in the last 30 years is the ice has gotten a lot thinner. And so what this shows, this is an animation showing, showing this ice age. So the whiter areas are old, thick ice. The areas that are a little more on the gray side are younger, thin ice. And this I'm going to show an animation. It's going to start in 1994, or sorry, 1984, and it's going to go up until 2016. And what I want you to look at is see. There we go. So what you I got to stand here. What you can see is that is that there's a lot of thick ice in the Arctic early in the time series in the early 1980s. What you can also see is that. The, some of the ice is being flushed out of the Arctic, particularly over on the eastern side of Greenland. 
Uh, there's a big mass of ice in the middle, sort of uh, right above Canada there. That's been, you can see it sort of swirling around. But it's, real, it's been relatively persistent for a long time. All of a sudden now what we're seeing is that more and more of that ice is starting to disappear. The thick ice is being replaced by much thinner ice. And you can see that happening. You can see it being flushed out. And as the time series goes on, what you can see is that more and more of that thick ice is actually melting. And you can see really clearly in, in 2004, there, we lost a bunch in 2004, in 2005. 2007 is going to be a really dramatic loss of the thick ice. Right there, we lost a huge amount of thick ice. In 2008, 2009, you can see there's very little white left compared to what there was at the beginning. Uh, 2011, very little left. There, a bunch just lost another big mass of ice. Some is still being flushed out, but more and more recently what we're having is the melting of that thicker ice. And so if you can compare this to what it started looking like, where it was almost completely white, the Arctic was over 40% thick old ice. Now there's very little thick old ice left in the Arctic. And in fact, the Arctic has lost over 75% of the volume of ice has disappeared in the last 30 years. And that is a big loss of ice. Oops. Uh, there we go. Now why is this happening? Uh, Eric alluded to some of the reasons. Uh, and as I said, one of them is atmospheric, there's been atmospheric circulation patterns that are, that are moving that ice out of the Arctic. Uh, that was sort of the beginning of the time series that I showed you. But more and more recently, what we're seeing is that warm waters are coming into the Arctic, melting the ice, and the Arctic temperatures of the, are also increasing, melting the ice. You put all those together, and what you end up with is something called the ice albedo feedback. And that's what's pictured here. What you see is at the top, under normal circumstances, what you've got is sunlight comes in, a lot of that sunlight bounces off the ice, that radiation goes back out to space, and the Arctic stays pretty cool. As you start losing some of that ice, though, the ocean absorbs light really well. The ice reflects it really well, but the ocean absorbs it. And as you start losing ice, you start heating up the ocean. The ocean heats up. It makes it harder to form ice the next year. You end up with less ice. And you end up with a positive feedback that ends up happening, where eventually what you do is you lose all the ice. This is what it looks like. As we're in this phase now. We're in the ice albedo feedback phase where it's just the loss of ice is accelerating as that ice is disappearing. I'm a biologist. Ice isn't my primary interest. What I'm really interested in is the productivity of the ocean. So what I would really like to know is, given the fact that all this ice is disappearing from the Arctic, how is that affecting the ecosystems there? And what I study myself is the base of the ecosystem. It's these guys here. These are called diatoms. They're tiny little plants. They're photosynthetic. And they're important because they consume a lot of the CO2 that we produce. They produce a lot of the oxygen that we breathe. But they are the food for basically everything that lives in the Arctic. Ultimately derives its food from these guys. So it's really important to know what's happening to plankton in the Arctic under these changing ice conditions. It's a hard thing to tell, though. The Arctic is a really difficult place to sample. It's hard to go there. It's expensive. You can't go very far. And so what we try to do is l use other tools. And the tools that I tend to use are satellites. And so we can look at the Arctic much more easily by satellite than we can on a cruise ship, although we do go on the cruise ships. And what we can do is we can get snapshots of different things of the Arctic basically every single day. We can see how warm it is, sea surface temperature. We can look at how much of those plants are there every single day. That's what that chlorophyll is. We can put that information together, combine it with an algorithm, and we can estimate how productive, how much food is being produced by the Arctic every day and every year. And when we do that, we can look and see how has things changed. And this is from 1998 to 2012. This is a change in productivity in the Arctic. And what you can see, obviously, is there's been a dramatic increase in the productivity. In fact, the productivity of the Arctic Ocean has increased 40% in 15 years. 40% in 15 years is huge for a whole, and for an entire ocean basin to have increased that big over that short amount of time is, it's, it's just, it's hard to fathom. Why is this happening? It's happening because of the big thaw that we talk about. We've lost all this ice. We lose the ice. What we do is we increase habitat 
for these particular organisms. So the Arctic is becoming much more productive. But by doing that, it's becoming much less Arctic. And so, so the system is changing. This is what's happening in open water, because we can measure this with satellites. But there's other things going on in the Arctic as well. And that is what's happening under the ice cover. And so we were on a cruise in 2010 and 2011 in the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea on this ship here. And what I'm going to show you is, is this is an animation. And it's, you're going you're gonna to be sort of real-time oceanographers here. What it's going to do, it's going to zoom in onto the study area. And you're going to see what we saw during this particular cruise. And I'll describe it as it goes. You're going to get a bird's eye view of what the ocean looks like if you were something swimming in it, for example. So there's our ship. It's hard to hope that you can see that better because I see a big white glare <laughs> here. What we're going to do is we're going to drop below the ocean. You can see that we're in open water here. We're heading toward the ice. And hopefully you can see it there. So we're, 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 we're sampling the water and we're measuring how much plankton is in the water. And eventually what's going to happen is this is going to turn colors. Purple colors mean there's very few plankton. And so you see a lot of purple in open water. We're headed toward the ice now. We're in the ice, and suddenly the purples start to turn green and red. Green and red mean there's lots of plankton. We are under one meter of ice at this point. We're under one meter of ice. You see that area of red there? That area of red is 30 meters thick. So we've got an area of 30 meters thick of basically pea soup plankton underneath a meter of sea ice. This is where we sort of headed off into deeper waters. We turned around. We saw that. We just said, we got to sample that again. So we went back and we sampled it again. There, we found that big phytoplankton bloom again. Again, a big 30 meter thick layer of nothing but algae. And this under the, we're still under the ice, you can see. We start heading into open water again. And we start seeing a lot more purple. When I was on this cruise, if somebody would have asked me if this was possible, I would have said, there's absolutely no way. There's no way you could have that much phytoplankton under that thick of ice. We've never seen it. My experience from the Ar Antarctic says it can't happen, but it happened. It happened here in the Arctic, and it, we've seen it at least three other years now, this same phenomenon, that the phytoplankton, they're not just blooming in open water, they're blooming under the ice. And this is what it looks like when you're actually there. That's on the right. On the left side is what you would normally expect to see under the ice, nice blue water. This is what we saw when we were there on the right, pea soup green. You couldn't even see the bottom of the ice. The visibility was maybe one or two meters, is as far as you could see. It was so thick. To put that into perspective of how much this was compared to what a global average would be, this is what we basically did was look at how much phytoplankton were, was, were in that water. If you just looked at from top to bottom and you added all the phytoplankton up, how much is it? On the far right, what we see is what the global mean would be. So this is if we looked at phytoplankton everywhere in the world, the productive regions, unproductive regions, every place. The global mean is about 46, and that's milligrams per meter squared. The units don't really make that much difference, but it's about 46. The average we saw in that bloom under the ice, one meter thick, was 840. The maximum was almost 1,300. This is the largest phytoplankton bloom ever measured in the world, ever, anywhere. The blue dot there was the previous high, and our maximum surpassed it. And so the question is, how can that possibly be? How can you have this much phytoplankton growth under the ice in the Arctic when the waters are minus 2 degrees? The reason is, is because the Arctic is not the, the new Arctic is not the old Arctic. This is the old Arctic. The old Arctic in the spring would look like this. You'd have lots of old ice, lots of ridged ice, relatively thick ice. Very little light is getting through this ice to the water column below. So those phytoplankton are not growing underneath this ice. This is what the Arctic looks like now most of the time, most places in the springtime. What we see is this is 100% ice cover, but it's all covered in meltwater. It's melt ponds. This situation, you transmit lots of light goes through this ice to those phytoplankton below. So this is a recipe for early, early phytoplankton blooms in the Arctic. So what does this all mean? 
First thing is the Arctic is losing ice at an alarming rate, which is really important for the animals that require ice to live. Uh, it's becoming much less polar. It's going to become something more like a temperate or subpolar region very soon. The productivity is increasing, and you can determine whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a different thing. It's going to be a different Arctic than it's been historically. It's increasing in the ice-free ocean, and now it's increasing in the ice-covered ocean as well. We don't know what the ecological impacts of this is going to be. Uh, we just have, it's too soon, it's happened too recently, we just don't know. And this is the one that worries me the most. Because ice is melting earlier, because now phytoplankton blooms aren't even waiting for the ice to melt anymore. They're blooming when there's still ice there. The timing of the blooms are changing by as much as a month. There's lots of animals that live in the Arctic that require the Arctic to be productive at a particular time of year. They've evolved to migrate to the Arctic, to be there when the productivity is at its peak. If productivity shifts a month earlier, those organisms may be in big trouble. And so this is what worries me. It's not that the Arctic is being more productive, it's that the timing is shifting a lot. And so with that, I will end my story and I will turn it over to Michelle. All right. Well, thank you. So to carry on from what Kevin was talking about, I'm just um, gonna uh, move us from what I consider the thin component of ice in the Arctic to the thicker components of ice in the Arctic. This is uh, just a figure to highlight what we're talking about. So this is from the IPCC report. And you can think about where, where ice exists um, on the land surface and over the ocean surface. We call that the cryosphere, the ice-covered world. And for when we're thinking about sea ice, um, we're thinking about what considers very thin, less than a meter's worth, and that will have rapid changes depending upon what the climate is doing. So if you look at the bottom here, this is the, t the time scales over which we can see these changes. So Kevin was just talking about over, over a year, over seasons, what we see. And what I look at is what's happening in terms of the thicker components of um, the cryosphere, so the glaciers and the ice sheets. And these glaciers and ice sheets for a long time we thought were very slow responders. So if you look at the time scales and we look at where the ice sheets are, we're talking about changes that occur over, the, over centuries. Um, but as, as uh, we're already seeing here, there's a lot of changes that are starting to happen more and more rapidly. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about. What's actually happening over months and years in terms of the edges of these ice sheets and the edges of these glaciers. So if we want to think about where ice is, land-based ice, so on ice sheets and glaciers, a lot of it is concentrated at the poles. This is the global distribution of, of glaciers um, around the world. And you can see that um, if you look at the two circles at the top, the one on the left is the Canadian Arctic uh, archipelago, and that has about 150,000 uh, square kilometers of ice cover. And then the second larger circle is the Greenland ice sheet, and that has about 1.7 million um, uh, square kilometers of ice cover. The Canadian ar archipelago is actually the largest land-based ice accumulation. It holds about a quarter of the ice that's not contained within the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet at the south. And the other thing I want you to notice here is in these circles, they have two different colors, a little bit hard to see here, but the blue refers to ice that terminates in the ocean, so tidewater glaciers, and the green are uh, land terminating glaciers. So if we zoom in, <coughs> as, as Kevin already mentioned, we're seeing some changes in the sea ice. We're also seeing changes in the glaciers, and this is predominantly driven by changes in temperature. So if you think about temperature and precipitation as the drivers of mass of ice, um, this, is, this is just the temperature trend that's happening in the Arctic. So over the last, this is in um, degrees C per decade. Red is three and a half degrees C for the last few decades. And if you see, we're seeing some hot spots of, um, of temperatures rising, you know, on the order of twice the rate of the global average, uh, particularly along the west coast of Greenland and around the Canadian Arctic. Now what this does to the glaciers is that it heats up the surface, so you'll have more melt that occurs in the summertime, and you'll have more, s more uh, water that falls as rain instead of snow, so that also helps to melt it. 
Now, that will change what's happening on the surface of these glaciers. But of course, if they're tidewater glaciers, they have an added dynamic. So they're trying to become in balance with whatever the temperatures are of the air, but also what's the circulation happening in the ocean along the edges. So a tidewater glacier, any glacier is trying to achieve some balance with the current climate. So what the temperatures are below zero degrees and also how much precipitation is falling as snow. And they'll accumulate on the land and then they'll deliver that to the ocean. If you have changes in the air temperature, you will have a reduction in the amount of ice that's accumulating um, and more melt that's occurring. Some of that melt will get to the bottom of the ice and that might allow it to accelerate towards the ocean. And then if you're heating the ocean temperatures, you're also gonna be melting more along the edges. Both melting of the ice from the thermal forcing of the ocean and e enhanced calving of icebergs and loss of ice. So there's, if we think about how these glaciers and ice sheets in the Canadian Arctic and in Greenland um, are, and in Antarctica are responding to shifts, um, they're gonna respond to shifts that are happening on the surface, shifts that are happening at the bed, and shifts that are happening on the boundary between the ice and the ocean. And a couple things can happen. One, in, if you think about it, if you have a warming temperature, you might have a decrease of elevation of the surface from melting. And if you have a decrease of the elevation of the surface of the glacier or the ice sheet from melting, what you'll end up doing is increasing the steepness of the slope between the accumulation area and the edge of the glacier or ice sheet. And that slope drives mass towards the edges. So the steeper the surface slope, the faster the ice will flow. So in the one, one change scenario is you're melting the surface and you're enhancing that flow towards the edge. Another change scenario is if you melt more along the edges. So that's panel B here, right? And you have more icebergs that are generated, more calving. Maybe you're rising the water level and so you're floating this ice. Um, and so you're gonna lose that mass. That will also shorten the distance between the center of the ice sheet or glacier and the edge and increase the slope. And so you'll have get an acceleration of mass towards the edges. And the third is if you can actually wet the underside of the ice, so the ice bed interface, you can actually lubricate that bed that will also allow it to flow faster. So these are all the ways in which an ice will, res ice will respond to these changing boundary conditions. So if we think about these tidewater glaciers and how they're responding to that temperature change, this was just a recent paper that came out looking at the Canadian Arctic archipelago and what's happening to the glaciers. So they looked at, la using Landsat images, looked at what happened before 2005 and what's happened since 2005 and calculated how much loss of mass is happening from uh, melting at the surface and how much loss of mass is happening from calving of ice along the edges, because that's what all you can see from space. You can't see what's under the water, um, unless you're looking at chlorophyll, but we can't see it from space. So what you see here is that change in temperature going from left to right is increasing the amount of surface melt, and it's also decreasing the relative proportion of calving or ice discharge that's happening in the Canadian Arctic. Now, I'm just showing this to you, this is a very recent work, and we don't fully understand what's going on here. So the one place that we have been studying in a lot of detail is the Greenland ice sheet. So I'm gonna leave, this is where I end and what I know about the Canadian Arctic thus far, because we really don't know that much, but we've concentrated over the last decade on what's happening in terms of Greenland. So I'm gonna start this with a little um, animation here that was put together by NASA. And this shows what has been happening in terms of the overall mass of the Greenland ice sheet over the last decade. So you see this blue line coming down through here. That blue line uh, indicates the total amount of mass of the Greenland ice sheet. And the colors are showing you the equivalent uh, water height loss, spatially distributed around the Greenland ice sheet. And as you can see, as we're going from 2005, now we're in 2011, going down to 2014, we're seeing an increased 
or cumulative loss of mass of the Greenland ice sheet. And a lot of that is happening along the edges. So the edges of this ice sheet are losing the most amount of mass. Now that might make sense because the edges of the ice sheet are also going to be the lowest, closest to sea level. But the other thing that's happening here is there's a lot of uncertainty, but there's also dynamic responses that are happening along the edge of the ice sheet. Oh, and we don't want to do that again. So if we were to take a look at it and think about the cumulative mass loss, so this is from the IPCC report. Um, what we see is we're seeing this increase in the amount of uh, ice being lost from this Greenland ice sheet, and this is equivalent to you know, eight millimeters of sea level uh, equivalent from 1992 to 2012. This was the last IPCC report. And you can see that there's an increase in the average rate of ice loss. So in the, in the first period, 1992 to early 2000s, the Greenland ice sheet was losing mass at about 30, 34 gigatons per year. And then over the uh, last um, decade, of the, the first decade of the 21st century, that increased almost 100-fold, or 8-fold, to 215 gigatons per year. As a relationship in the Canadian Arctic archipelago is now losing ice at about 30 gigatons per year, so similar to what Greenland was doing in the last decade. The blue bars here is this uncertainty range, and that uncertainty range has a lot to do with what's happening along the edges and how much are we losing mass, and how much is that mass going to accelerate? So we can see this rising acceleration. A lot of that has to do with how that ice is being transported from the interior of the ice sheet towards the edges. So this is another um, uh, image that just shows the velocity of the surface of the ice as it goes towards the edges. Purple means it's moving at kilometers per year, and um, yellow is moving at uh, 100, 200 meters per year. And you can see that the ice is being drawn and accelerating towards the edges of the ice sheet as it, as it gets closer and closer to the ocean. Not only is the ice moving and accelerating, that acceleration is speeding up with time. So this is just one example. This is Jakobshaven um, Glacier. Or um, which is on the west coast of Greenland. You can see it there. It's the huge bar. And Jakobshaven actually drains about 40% of the Greenland ice sheet. In 1992, they imaged the surface, so we use speckle tracking to figure out what the surface speeds are. And you can see in 1992, it was moving at, it was moving at about 11 kilometers per year right along the edges. And as we move to 2000, we've actually seen an acceleration. So as the ice is shrinking and retreating, it's also speeding up. This speed up is happening because of two different factors. So the first factor is we have surfaces, temperatures warming. That temperature warming increases meltwater at the surface. Just like we're seeing with sea ice, that meltwater actually um, can absorb uh, heat better and hold heat along the ice surface better, and it creates these lakes, and these meltwater lakes that start to pond up on the surface of the ice sheet. If these meltwater lakes come in contact with a moulin, they will drain, and then we'll get, uh, we'll get water that goes from the surface all the way to the bed. And what we're seeing is, as these meltwater lakes drain, they allow the flow, the flow of the ice to speed up. So where these lakes are draining, they're getting to the bed, and they allow the ice to speed up. And that's one factor that's accelerating the loss of ice in the Arctic, uh, of glaciers and ice sheets. The other factor is what happens when this ice meets the ocean. So here's another glacier in West Greenland. And when it meets the ocean, it's actually coming in contact with warm saline waters. And these warm saline waters are being drawn towards the ice front by this cold meltwater that's coming to the surface. So part of what I've been working on is actually quantifying how much of that warm saline water is actually melting the front of this ice and helping it to lose mass. So on the left, you see a picture. This is a boat for scale, a sailboat. And from that sailboat, we were actually dropping um, conductivity and depth profiles and looking at the salinity and the conductivity and the temperature. So you can see some of the, what the, the profiles that we would measure. And you can see here that there's, a lot, there's some warm water right along the edges. And then as you get up close to the surface, you get cold water that's melting. 
And from these calculations, we can come up with how much melt is occurring. So I'll just show you a little bit of the kind of things that we're seeing. So this is, this is an, um, a video of a calving event that happened right at that same place. So remember that sailboat? There was a sailboat there probably five hours before this calving event happened. Um, that's about a 100 meter ice cliff there and it's starting to calve and you can start to see what's happening under the ocean. So under the water surface, you could see some um, smoothing of the ice under the water surface here. We'll zoom in here on the right. And you can see that there's actual runnels where water is um, melting the front of the ice. And from the calculations that we took with these small sailboats, we're seeing that the amount of melt that's happening under the water is equivalent to the amount of melt that's happening at the surface of these glaciers. So the ice is being drawn to the ocean and increasing in the amount of meltwater that's produced, both from air temperatures warming and also oceans forcing these glaciers to, to melt and draw down ice. And I could sit here and watch this all day, but I won't make you do that. But you could see some of these runnels here on the left. That meltwater is important not only because it's accelerating the ice, but what it can also do is, is uh, increase the capacity of this ice to erode the landscape underneath it. So meltwater, not only does it allow ice to flow more rapidly, but as that ice is flowing more rapidly over the bed, it can do more work on the bed. So it's producing more sediment. And that meltwater is delivering that sediment to the edge of the glaciers and the ice sheet. So what we're seeing here in the polar regions is that not only are we seeing an acceleration of loss of ice, we're seeing the ice speeding up, and we're seeing more uh, nutrients and sediment being delivered to the, to the edges of the ice sheet. And this has repercussions not only for the land and how that's responding to the, um, the loss of ice, but also for the people that work in these areas. So this, this was in front of Store Glacier, we met some local fishermen, and this is um, a very productive halibut fishery on the west coast of Greenland, some of the major halibut fisheries. And the halibut, of course, is a bottom feeder and is very attuned to what sediment fluxes and accumulation rates are doing at the base of the fjords. And so this, these changes that are occurring are affecting freshwater delivery to communities living all along the edges of ice. It's affecting the aquatic habitat and it's also affecting hazards that are occurring along here. Can I take a minute to, do, to show you a hazard? So we're thinking about what's changing here for these people. One of the other aspects that I've looked at is also what happens as the ice shrinks. So one of the things that happens when ice shrinks and um, retreats is that it exposes the landscape along the edges. And the landscape has been, the, the slopes that are uh, created in these glaciated landscapes are are very steep, they're over steepened, and the ice pushes back on the slopes and holds them in place. Now if you remove the ice, so here's one example, this is a glacier in southeast Alaska that has retreated quite rapidly, it's exposing all these slopes that you see here. This is just one example of what can happen. If you expose a slope and you don't have any back pressures on it, you can have a massive landslide. And so we're seeing an increased frequency of these massive landslides. And some of these landslides are happening onto the ice. Some of them are happening right into the coastal waters. And this, ha this uh, event we actually detected using seismometers. And it not only created a landslide, it also created a tsunami. A tsunami wave that extended up 190 meters. So I'll, I'm just going to show you a little video that shows kind of what that destruction can be, if I can get this to work. So this event, this landslide and tsunami, 
that occurred here in Ton Fjord is a huge event. It's one of the largest tsunamis that we have ever seen in modern history. The end of where the tsunami went, it's the limit of inundation there. It was about 176 meters that trimmed the forest on the sides of the sides of the fjord. In many places, 50, 60 meters, you know, 200 feet or so up the valley walls. In at least one place, 180, 185 meters up, so 600 odd feet. Taking that scientific information, putting it through the engineering interpretation, and then being able to provide a product to policymakers, to local emergency managers, that allows them to make decisions when events occur, this is the end goal. I'm very grateful of, of working with people who really know what they're doing out here. Access is at best sketchy. actually get out here and see how big a mountain just collapsed into the fjord. It, it's absolutely surprising. So that's just one example of the, of the hazards that we're seeing that are starting to become more and more frequent and of larger, larger magnitude as a function of these glaciers retreating. This is just a map version of what you saw in that video of a landslide that happened because the glacier had pulled back um, and exposed an oversteepened slope and the tsunami that was generated because, it, because that landslide ended right in the water. And this is happening more frequently and luckily, in this instance, this was happened in a national park where there aren't a whole lot of um, tourists that, um, that frequent it, and there aren't very many communities that live within this part of, of um, the coast. But there are plenty of other places where there are a lot of recreation, where there is a lot of tourism, and there are a lot of communities that are existing within these same systems. This is just another example of one that happened the same um, year as, well, while we were actually out in Icy Bay, another landslide happened up on a glacier in Glacier Bay, which is a place where there are cruise ships passing through daily with 5,000 people aboard and a lot of infrastructure in place. So we gotta think about, not only are these, are the, is the ice changing, but it's also affecting the communities here and affecting the infrastructure. So on that note, I'd like to invite Candace to come up and tell us more about these human impacts. Um, so uh, thanks so much for having me here. Uh, I am a member of the Taltan Nation, which is in northwestern BC, um, not so far from some of these uh, images that Michelle has been showing you. But I also just want to acknowledge that we are on uh, land that belongs to its unceded territory uh, to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Um, and uh, I often start that way even outside of BC uh, because I want to acknowledge the ongoing challenges, the deep history and legacies of colonialism like displacement, broken or non-existent treaties, and intergenerational trauma that gets shifted off to the side and swallowed up or subsumed by crises like climate change. So the Arctic you know, presents uh, an additional challenge. Um, to witnessing and narrating a crisis very much along the lines of what we've seen here tonight with all of these really you know, incredible uh, animations and uh, statements about what is happening in the Arctic, right? So the Arctic is far away, it's sparsely populated. It crosses eight national borders. The frozen landscape images that we're accustomed to seeing you know, starkly demonstrated as an almost empty space, right? It's remote and unknowable. So how is media doing when it reports on a place like the Arctic? We know that climate change reporting has gone down and since about 2007, um, 2009, we've seen a, a definite decline, but how are we doing when media reports on the Arctic? Well, in Canada, uh, people have looked at spe specifically the Canadian national media, 
And between 2006 and 2010, they found that, surprise, surprise, the Arctic is not central to news about climate change, um, and that people in communities are rarely quoted. Outside of Canada, um, studies that have looked at media more broadly show that the Arctic gets framed mostly as being about the resources that are in it. So as all of these changes take place, there's a kind of cold rush, right? A race for resources. There's a new cold war between Russia and the US over resources. There's uh, conflicts between oil companies and environmental groups. And so the Arctic sometimes bumps up in coverage when things like um, you know, the kayak protests in Seattle happen when the polar explorer was heading to the Arctic. Um, it also gets a lot of coverage when, like the 2007 sea ice recession that um, Kevin showed you, uh, you know, that kind of thing gets quite a lot of coverage. Uh, more recently, our team looked at um, the COP21 coverage in Paris, right, this team that I lead on uh, Arctic journalism, and what we discovered is that when you look at, and we're one of the very first studies to look at international, national media, as well as regional media, and uh, you know, this was a, a pretty incredible um, show of Arctic force in, in Paris during the uh, Conference of the Parties, right? This is the 21st uh, meeting. Um, and uh, it was interesting, right, because if you look at the numbers, you see that um, if the CBC didn't report on Arctic communities, no other media would have, right? The Globe and Mail, the Toronto Star, the National Post, they did not rep quote or mention Arctic communities. There were very few uh, stories on the Arctic. Um, and if you look back, that actually, this is actually an image of um, glaciers from Greenland that were shown uh, on display in Paris. Um, oops, sorry. And uh, so, the, you know, there was a, a real strong Arctic presence there, but there wasn't much reporting on the Arctic itself, certainly in Canadian media and not much in international media as well. Um, and, but, you know, this is actually an improvement because studies in 2009 at the COP15 in Copenhagen showed that out of 129 articles by the Globe and Mail, not one indigenous person was quoted or featured, so there were no communities talked about, um, and there were a lot more articles at that time. You know, what's hopeful is that as we move into a more hybrid media landscape and, and social media allows for a direct address, you get uh, responses like this after the Paris Agreement uh, was announced. Ogalik Igiziak, who is the current uh, chair of the Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, she's Canadian, but she's the international chair. She actually went online and said, hey, countries failed, right? She tweeted out countries failed to a, a lot of reporters uh, because the Arctic was not mentioned, right? Indigenous people were mentioned, traditional knowledge was mentioned, but the Arctic, there was no mention of it in the Paris Agreement. Um, and so she said, you know, this, the agreement was historic, yes, but Inuit and Sami peoples wanted to have more recognition and respect for Arctic peoples. Because when we think about climate change, we think about the presentations we've heard tonight, right, where you see direct evidence of change and ongoing change. And we don't know what a lot of this change and difference means, right? If we're looking at a new Arctic, what does that actually mean for people who live there? And she went on to say, you know, the polar bears aren't the spokespeople for climate change, right? It's the peoples of the Arctic. Uh, so stop using polar bears and seals. Use Inuit as fact-based traditional knowledge holders. Right? So this gets at a much more deeper structural issue that has, uh, you know, challenged all transnational work around climate change. In the original uh, 1992, uh, UN uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, right, the Arctic was not mentioned. Instead, the concern was around low-lying nations that were vulnerable to sea level rise. There wasn't a lot of connection to how that sea level rise was happening. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't actually even see any mention of indigenous people until 2005. And that was after the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment came out, which brought together traditional knowledge and brought together scientific knowledge 
so that there were there was a, you know a conversation going on between these two to think about how change in the Arctic was happening. Um, it wasn't actually until COP16 in Cancun, so that's 2010, it's now 2017, so seven years ago, that you start to see indigenous people mentioned frequently in terms of impact and adaptation in uh, COP documents. So there was hardly any mention in Copenhagen, there was hardly any mention um, in other COPs as well. So what is traditional knowledge? How do we begin to think about what that is, right? Um, certainly, it involves thinking more broadly about what and who is in the Arctic. Um, you know, the upside of social media is that Ogalic Igiziak can come on and say, hey, countries failed, the Paris Agreement didn't mention the Arctic, but it also means that this is one of the most popular tweets during COP21, welcome to the Arctic, population zero. Right, so my students who were working on this Arctic journalism project with me at the time, they were just like gobsmacked, <laughs> shocked by this sort of tweet going out. Um, so the Arctic Climate Impact Assessment came out with you know, a pretty incredible at the time, in 2004, we weren't seeing these kinds of projections yet. We weren't seeing this very regional um, application of the IPCC style reports, right? So this is a, a pretty major intervention and it involved traditional knowledge, right? Okay, so the quote has gone off. This is what happens when you move from keynote to PowerPoint. Um, this is a quote from Robin Kimmerer who is in, an indigenous woman who is also a, a biologist. And she says that traditional knowledge is a rational and reliable knowledge that has been developed through generations of intimate contact by native peoples with their lands, right? And most importantly, it is a, it is a part of lived reality. So um, Daniel Wildcat, who is also an indigenous scholar, has talked about it like this, you know, unlike most citizens who form their opinions based on climate change, or climate change based on cable news networks, internet sites, and even paper news publications, American Indian and Alaska Native awareness of climate change is the result of practical life way experiences and sensitivity to rhythms of seasons that make them particularly knowledgeable about what is going on where they live. And this image that's in the background is an image from Kotzebue. When I went to go do field work uh, for a book that I wrote uh, several years ago, I had an elder take me out onto this landscape and he showed me what climate change looks like in the summer there. And what it looks like is this. It's cotton grass moving into the tundra, which pushes out the lichen, which is what caribou feed on. Right, so this beautiful cotton grass is actually a, a very potent symbol of climate change and what it feels like to live in a landscape that is undergoing enormous change. Right, and he's, he was a, um, a really important elder in, uh, in Alaska because he was all about the ground truthing, right? He was trying to both work with scientists and work with communities to try to, to bring these knowledges together, the scientific knowledge and the traditional knowledge. And, uh, you know, it's also at that same time I started talking with Sheila Watt Cloutier, who's, you know, pretty well a household name here in Canada because of this book that she's written. Um, called The Right to be Cold. Um, and, you know, what was fascinating when I first began talking with her and first began talking with this elder in Alaska is the way that climate change actually exacerbates a lot of, and amplifies a lot of the existing challenges in the Arctic among communities, right, that are already struggling with colonialism and displacement and uh, enclosure and forced assimilation and lack of treaties, right, lack of self-determination and you know ongoing discrimination and so Sheila Watt Cloutier's work has been about transforming climate change into a human rights issue so that we begin to understand that climate change is really one of the latest changes to come to the Arctic and it's layered on top of existing challenges um, and so, you know, if you've read her book, you know that she also talks about how challenging it is to bring the warmth of the Arctic to those of, in the, those of us in the South, to help those in places of power understand that ice is life for Inuit people. Yet one of her big successes has also been that she has worked with media to help her tell her story and to tell the story of her communities. Um, and this is really the biggest challenge um, in this book that I wrote 
called How Climate Change Comes to Matter, one of the things I discuss is that there's a real double bind to talking about climate change, where you both need to be faithful to the science, and at the same time, climate ch change needs to become much more than that, right? And this ext extends well beyond Arctic stories. Um, the other groups I talk to are, are quite different than um, Shilawak Cloutier and, and what Inuit people have been dealing with. Um, you know, I talked also to evangelical Christians. I talked also to corporate social responsibility activists and to scientists who are working in the policy arena and, and to science journalists, right? And so this is a really common thread between all of these groups who are trying to talk about climate change to diverse publics is that you really have to both maintain fidelity to the science and be able to tell stories about it and to talk about it so that people come to care about it so that it becomes invested with ethics and with morality such that there's a rationale to act. But the challenge with the Arctic in particular, right, is that the Arctic becomes a proxy for us to understand climate change. But how much of that proxy then transfers to the communities and to the people who live there? And reducing people to proxies, you know, ignores the ways in which indigenous people have adapted and conceived of ecosystems as always evolving. So northern and indigenous people need to be understood as experts um, in you know, the climate change that is going on, but also um, in regard to understanding how climate change amplifies existing crises related to colonial structures. There's a, a fantastic academic in the US who looks specifically at Shishmaref in Alaska and recognize the ways in which that community, which has you know, sort of been a poster child for climate change because of the way that the permafrost is melting and there's coastal erosion and buildings are falling into the ocean, storms are getting more intense. And what she looked, when she looked at that community, she discovered that there was, most of the infrastructure there was all from colonial periods, right? It was all decisions made and enforced on the community as opposed to working with the community to, uh, you know, evolve uh, adaptation, work with change, um, deal with changing landscapes. And so, uh, you know, when communities now begin to talk about climate change, they talk about it on their own terms. In the journalists that I've talked to in the Arctic, they don't tell climate change stories anymore. Instead, they tell stories about what is happening and climate change is something that's always ongoing. And so part of the challenge uh, with climate change as a crisis, right, is that it, it silences some voices and amplifies others. And so we need to think about the stakes of how things get defined, how things get circumscribed, and who gets to speak for what's happening and what kinds of changes that are happening. Basically, how we learn to deal with difference um, and what a new Arctic means in, in Kevin's terms. Um, and so, uh, we have things to learn then from regional media, which has been, you know, talking to communities, talking to uh, communities about how they're dealing with change. And I think that was it for me. Yeah, there you go. Um, and Michelle, um, a little bit of a frightening picture I think of of uh, what can happen when all that weight of all that ice kind of gets pulled away from the the sides of these you know th these hillsides and these cliffs. Um, have you seen evidence of of potential hazards like that in the Canadian Arctic, like you saw in, in Alaska? So um, at, we we haven't as of yet seen some of this, um, but. You can, to go, to go to Kevin's reference about what the new Arctic will look like, well, we can also think about uh, what are we seeing on the edges of the Arctic are gonna propagate to the north. We're gonna go from warmer, more temperate, where things are moving more quickly, um, and where the expectation is that's what we're gonna be, end up seeing in the Canadian Arctic in, not, mm -hmm. in the not too distant future, in the next few decades. So right now we're seeing increases in the frequency and also the magnitude of the, the landscape relaxing in response to the ice going away. 
um, happening down in the te more temperate parts of Alaska, but we're also seeing that propagating up to the north in Alaska at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, seeing increased frequency of these kinds of events um, that we're capturing with seismic uh, records. Um, but, you know, the inference there is if we take a trading space for time approach, that time is coming soon to the pole, the more polar regions. Yeah. So we see that increase. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, and, and Candace, for you, I guess what, what what I'm thinking about is, you know, what is it that we need to do to increase the attention to and the inclusion of northern perspectives in media? Um, what, what is it, how do, we, how do we encourage media to do that? How do we empower northern voices more effectively? Um, yeah, I mean, the one thing I didn't talk about much is the way that it gets covered. So I talked about what's missing, but um, media in Canada tend to cover climate change as a policy issue uh, connected to energy and resources. They don't tend to cover it as a community issue. And that's probably why they don't talk very much to communities. So if we begin to think about climate change as a much more re lived reality, um, as uh, something that communities are actually experiencing and um, trying to negotiate uh, adaptation and resilience plans and those kinds of things, then it becomes a much different conversation than one in which what's happening with the IPCC, what's happening with um, you know, the various COPs, what's Canada's role in the world, as opposed to what is Canada doing to address climate change here? And it's you know not just the Arctic. There's a lot of sub-Arctic communities. There's a lot of rural communities in Canada, um, and we don't tend to think of ourselves as a, you know a rural, multicultural country in that sensibility, right? We have uh, you know 60 languages in this country, not just two, right? So beginning to think about ourselves um, as you know needing to address climate change regionally. Um, and particularly in the Arctic where it's happening at such a fast rate. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to open it up to the audience and um, we are recording this this evening and it would be helpful if, if you would be willing to come down to uh, the microphone where Jonathan is there. Um, if you have a question or something you'd like to, uh, to address. Ah, Philly. Jonathan, are we able to to pass the mic? It's best if folks come down. So okay. Just think of a question and then you can come here and write My question is for Candace primarily regarding your thoughts on the role, expanding role of social media, and the way in which the way that it enables us to flip the the tables, I guess, on journalism, traditional journalism. And in particular, what you know about the expanding use of social media vis-a-vis -vis potential technical limitations and bandwidth and stuff like that. So what are the constraints on the wide distribution of social media and the implementation of that as a tool for northern people to tell their own stories? Yeah, that's a super interesting question for me. Um, simply because when I... Um, was doing uh, field work in the Arctic last, or in the Northern Territories in Canada um, in the last summer, what you really see there is, you, you see the limitations of the internet and the possibilities of it, right? So you have a lot of satellite uh, uplinks, you have slow connections, but you have the dominance of Facebook. It's incredible, right? Both as a distribution platform for news, but also as an accountability mechanism. So. Um, you know, when you look at regional coverage of something like COP21, yes, of course, they're mentioning communities a lot, but they're also in conversation with these communities. So the big challenge for Arctic journalism is that they, you know, it costs five, ten thousand dollars to get into these communities to report. So a lot of reporting is done by phone, but you also have Facebook as this really interesting um, intermediary, which is a two-way device, right? You have people 
um, talking back as much as uh, being talked to. In fact, probably uh, much more talking back, right? And, and sort of uh, reporters get instant feedback on their stories. So, you know, it is sort of this in incredible um, change factor and yet, uh, you know, I thought when I went to the Arctic that I would experience a lot more thinking beyond the region, a lot more thinking about audiences beyond the region, but um, that isn't so much the case. So this, so social media is acting in the Arctic and in Northern Territories, uh, but it's not necessarily bringing in that many new audiences. And so I wonder about that, like that to me is an open question about how you promote uh, broader engagement, um, and I think that's a broader question about social media as a tool and what kind of tool it is. Okay. Do we have any other questions? So anybody on the other side of the theater, if you have a question, just walk up the stairs and go through that door, and you can come across the other side to the back. Just take a second. Uh, just, actually, I wanted to say something about your first question about the nutrient limitation. Uh, it's been suggested that actually the nutrient is a very dynamic system as well. And so you have increased river input now to the Arctic. You have increased uh, coastal erosion, uh, sediment transport. And it could be that the nutrient dynamic is changing, that you're getting more nutrients put into it on top of the uh, sea ice diminishment and more light and all that. So it's not just one aspect of the system, but many aspects of the system. Hmm. That was that. Makes sense. I agree. Yes. <laughs> and I'll just uh, ask our speakers. No. I'll just ask our speakers if, if for some reason you can't hear on the mic, if you could just repeat the question, that would be great. Did you guys hear the question? Sounds like you did. Okay. Hi. So my question is about the the big phytoplankton bloom under the ice. Um, is there a possibility to differentiate between the ice algae and the and the phytoplankton per se. Yes, that was when we reported that, that was the first thing we heard from a lot of people saying that there was no way you saw this phytoplankton bloom under the ice. It was probably just ice algae that fell into the water. Uh, when you look at, it's easy to tell the difference. Well, there's a few different ways. One, the species that were in the ice are not the species that we saw in the water. The species we saw in the water are species that only bloom in the water. Uh, we didn't see any ice algal species at all. The other thing is, is the amount, of, the amount of stuff, the amount of phytoplankton that were there, there was way too, I mean, orders of magnitude more than you ever find in the ice. So even if every algal cell that was in the ice fell into the water, it could not explain the amount of phytoplankton we saw. So it's definitely not ice algae. I have a question. Sure. Sorry. My question is, uh, do, do these phytoplankton, do they, uh, do they, bloom more readily in higher salinity environments so that they require, like the more sea ice you're generating, the higher the brine content un right underneath the ice. Is that a factor in their productivity? Yeah, the, the, probably not. The salinity differences were really small. There was, and at the time we saw the bloom, ice was actually starting to melt some. So there was a little bit of, it wasn't so much high salinity, it was a little bit of low salinity. Uh, but these algae tend not to be that sensitive to salinity anyway. Uh, as long as it's around seawater salinity, they do just fine. Okay. You had it. I'll try and project. So uh, most of the people that live above the Arctic Circle likely live in, in Russia today. I'm just wondering how easy it is for um, communities and individuals to share experiences and share information uh, across Could everybody hear that question? Um, so he's asking about um, the communities above the Arctic Circle that most of them would be in Russia and how easy it, is it for them to share experiences. Um, and I, it's very difficult, right? The situation in Russia is quite different um, than um, anywhere else uh, <laughs> in the circumpolar world. Um, however, I, I attended a conference in London last uh, summer, and it was really interesting because it was a, a UK academic. Um, her name is Olga 
Ultur Gashiva, and she is Siberian, and uh, she brought in reindeer herders <laughs> to the conference to talk about um, basically what the landscape changes look and feel like, and it was really incredible. I've never heard a talk like that where they talked about the hydraulic changes and basically with the permafrost melt, landscape is changing and for reindeer herders that really means something, right? Because you don't know where to herd, the land doesn't look like it used to. Um, and so it was like the first time I had heard this kind of a talk. So I think there are efforts to make those, um, to make those connections but they are really happening by you know, a few people making those connections, a few researchers bringing people along. Um, and so I think uh, for communities, there's not, there, are not, there are not that many avenues. Um, I don't know, Julie Cruikshank is here, amazing anthropologist. Right, so Julie was just pointing out that there's so many different languages there. Um, you know, as a, you know, there's a number of languages in North America, but there's a lot in, in Russia. Um, it's, you know, <laughs> orders of magnitude almost. Um, and and uh, not a lot of state funding for organizations um, as well. So there's actually some really good work on that particularly as well. Um. I think, is it Michelle? Yeah. When I was watching those videos um, of that landslide, landslide, as someone who spent a little bit of time in the Arctic, I was wondering, is there planning happening at the community level for what that would look like? In the communities I spent time in, I, I can't even imagine what the response would be for the people there, let alone the ecosystem. So I'm wondering if anyone could speak to that at all. Uh, the, the short answer is no. I think most of these communities have not, you know, the, the, these changes are happening in, in, in real time frequency in like only the last decade have we seen an increase in these. So that, yeah, that hasn't actually gone into any mitigation plans. And the hope is by, by um, tracking these events, particularly in places where the communities haven't, there is no infrastructure and there, you know, there, a lot of these places don't have infra, infrastructure, don't have communities that are aware of the, uh, aware of these events. Um, but as we see that the increase in magnitude and we can start to look at what coastal regions are going, are, you know, what is our expectation for how these coastal regions are going to respond to deglaciation, which is happening circumpolar. Um, then we can start to plan, or at least predict, what, where the you know where these risks are increasing, the most dramatically. Yeah. And maybe Candice, I'm wondering if you can speak to that from like the the concept of traditional knowledge and if that's happening, maybe not at like the policy level, but um, yeah, like what are our indigenous people talking about this in the Arctic and? Yeah, thought. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's really interesting. Um, when I first started doing research, it was in the early to mid 2000s, and I feel like, and, and maybe Julie should weigh in on this. <laughs> if you guys don't know who Julie Cruikshank is, she's here. She wrote this incredible book called "Do Glaciers Listen?" It's, it's so worth a read. Um, and you know, the thing that what people were talking about in the early to mid 2000s, I feel like was we need to get traditional knowledge as part of the record. We need to um, have it, you know, to help us understand the history of change, the deep history of change, right? Um, and now I feel like the conversation has really shifted in the last few years where people are saying, actually traditional knowledge is a way of apprehending the world. And it provides not just data, but meaning and a framework for not only understanding change, but navigating it. And so I think that that's more the direction where people are thinking and saying, okay, traditional knowledge is not just this thing we add to scientific knowledge and mix and come out with a better understanding of climate change. Now they're saying, actually, traditional knowledge provides us with a pathway to resilience, with a better pathway to adaptation, and communities who have been evolving and adapting along with the lands that they live in for thousands and thousands of years, uh, you know, they actually might be able to <laughs> use that same knowledge to adapt to this change, even though it's rapid, even though we're looking at these, you know, uh, unheard of kinds of um, events, right? 
<laughs> um, so toward the like the phytoplankton, um, is it becoming a big problem in which um, there's something that needs to be like done not just toward climate change but just toward that, and will it become a larger problem in the future that that will need to be done? Something will need to be done to stop like that from progressing. You can't stop it. I mean, there's no way. To, there's well, I shouldn't say there's no way to stop it. There's we could reverse climate change and that would stop it. Uh, the issue is we don't know if it's a problem. Uh, we, know, we know the ecosystem is gonna change a lot. We know that if you shift from, there's a big difference for the ecosystem whether you've got phytoplankton growing in open water or under the ice. Because when they're growing under the ice, they're growing in very cold water and they just die and sink to the bottom. And they don't, they don't feed the rest of the ecosystem that lives in the water. They feed the clams and they feed the amphipods. Whereas when you've got phytoplankton growing in open water, like has historically happened, when the ice retreats, that's, then the algae grow. Those are feeding the plankton in the water that are being eaten by the fish, that are being eaten by the bowhead whales that the subsistence hunters need. And so, so we can imagine it shifting from something, a system that favors bowhead whales to one that favors gray whales, for example can't stop it. I don't really know what you can do about it. I mean, you can try to adapt to it, I suppose. Uh, but the trajectory is there's going to be more and more, a higher and higher percentage of the, of the blooms are going to be happening under the ice, not in open water, and that's going to have a big impact on the ecosystem, and there's really nothing we can do about it short of stopping the melting of the ice, which I don't know how we do. Do we have any other questions? I wanted to just, uh, Kevin, just to clarify something um, that you had mentioned. Um, you said 40% increase in productivity over 15 years, the last 15 years. Has there been any signal that that's working its way up the food chain at all? It's 15 years is such a short amount of time. Yeah. It's really hard to tell. Uh, I mean, the, we do know, for example, now that that hasn't happened really before is, you know, gray whales are migrating farther north, they're starting to eat krill now instead of amphipods, there's changes going on in the ecosystem, it's hard to know if it's because of that or not. Uh, the increased productivity, like I said, it's, it's such a short blip, it's really hard to know, uh, you know, exactly what kind of impacts it may have caused. There's no, there's no clear evidence yet that we can see in terms of uh, ecosystem shifts, but it's, I think it's too early. Okay. Hello. I have a question for Candace. So f I'm convinced that we really need to listen to this knowledge from the First Nations, this amazing knowledge that they have and how they want to move forward. So the question is how we go about this. When you talk to them, do you feel like what they want to do is to have a voice within that I speak to us? Or do you feel like they want to um, talk to you and be somebody like you to report what they want to report to us? Like, how do you think we can do this? What, what, I want to know what do they want to do, not what we think we should do. Like, hmm. Hmm. <laughs> well, that's not a hard question. Um, <laughs> You know, it's interesting, I, um, I just finished doing these two really big honkin' review essays for the Oxford Encyclopedia of Climate Change Communication, and one of the quotes that just jumped out to me when you were talking is um, uh, Patricia Cochran, along with a number of um, Inupiaq, which is what Inuit people um, call themselves in Alaska, a number of Inupiaq authors, they joined together and they, they wrote this really interesting essay in climatic change, um, Cochrane et al, if you want to look it up. Um, and uh, she just, you know, the authors, in, including Patricia Cochrane, talked about uh, how indigenous people have many ways of understanding change and many ways of making sense of it. Um, and, you know, there's like, um, I don't know, uh, hundreds of indigenous people in North America alone. Uh, you look outside of North America, you see you know, hundreds and hundreds more, right? There's been all of this negotiation at the UN level 
around defining who indigenous people are. So there's many different ways, there's many different indigenous people, and, and part of the beauty of um, terms like indigenous and First Nation is that um, they both speak to the commonality of experiences and at the same time um, speak to the diversity among those experiences. And so I don't know if you can make very many blanket statements, but you can, um, in the commonality aspect of it, you can see that most indigenous people want self-determination. They want to use their knowledge to establish um, resilient uh, adaptation plans that are um, you know, reflect their knowledge about the world, their experiences in the world. And I think that uh, when you see the kind of activism around COP, uh, or a COP, right, like around a conference of the parties, the one in Paris, um, you know, uh, you see a lot of incredible activism towards this end, right, towards having a seat at the table such that um, plans aren't once again, as in the colonial period, enforced on them, that knowledge is both heard and respected and honored and, um, you know, seen as um, a, a way of building resilience, a way of moving towards um, pathways that uh, will uh, bring greater self-determination. And so I think that that's really um, the way in which to understand a lot of indigenous articulations around climate change is to understand them as part and parcel of a long uh, push, and particularly since the 1970s, towards more self-determination, towards um, working through a lot of the um, challenges that colonial infrastructure has put it, um, in the way of adaptation, actually. Thank you. Okay, we have time for I think one more question. If Can I ask the last question? So uh, just very briefly, uh, if everyone in this room was going to walk away tonight and do what you thought they should do in sharing what they've learned tonight about the Arctic or what they could do about climate change, what message would you want them to walk away with? You get this at every talk, right? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Great. Well, I mean, from my perspective, I think it's just, you know, the realization that the Arctic, you know, if we want to maintain the Arctic as the Arctic, that we know something has to happen really drastically and has to happen really fast. I and mean, that's what I would say. Uh, I'm not particularly optimistic, but, you know, I would hope something like that could happen. But it, it's going to be, it's going to have to be fast and it's going to have to be big. And that's what I would say. I would say that the Arctic is not going to be the Arctic. And so we need to understand what, we, we need to put ourselves in the position of what it will be like in 20, 30 years for the people there and for the world as a whole. And create an awareness for what what will be instead of a hope for what once was. I think, um, first of all, it's been amazing to um, hear these presentations because um, I talk a lot about media and community representation, but to understand that alongside the kinds of changes and the, the, um, the complexity of those changes and the, um, the scale of them, right? Uh, you know, there are, it isn't population zero, it's population quite a lot. And it's, uh, you know, people who both have a complex understanding of change and who are about to experience, you know, enormous change. So I think, uh, you know, understanding that um, this region of the world ha is experiencing disproportionate effects of many uh, processes <laughs> of globalization that they haven't actually benefited from, you know, is, a, is, you know, part of the climate justice narrative, but also, you know, it is really talking to communities and understanding them as both resilient and um, experiencing disproportionate impacts, right? Those two go together. <laughs>
Yeah, and I would say to go back to what you were talking about, a lot of it is an awareness that these communities have been living on the edge of shift for a long time. So they have a lot to teach us about how do we adapt to that change, because they've been feeling that change for a lot longer than any of us have been aware of. Sounds like a great place to end it. Um, I want to give a round of applause one more time for our three speakers tonight. <laughs> three very interesting perspectives. And I want to thank the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies as well for uh, partnering with us on this and, and making this happen. And thank you, Philippe, for that. And uh, we thank you all for coming out tonight. <laughs>